Good morning and welcome to the new session on money and banking. This is on chapter 9, first session. We are going to talk about the importance of money and banking in economics. So moving forward, what is that we have got today to look into in terms of money and banking? These are the topics that we are going to cover today. We're going to start with a basic introduction of what is money and the importance of money, functions of money, demand of money, and the supply, the money creation by the banking system, very, very important topic, and the balance sheet that's going to be created by a fictional bank altogether. So now, before we start up, the concept of money itself is very, very interesting and very important. Why? Because any economic system in this world survives because of money. When we talk the word economics itself, the concept lies in money, in wealth creation. So money and banking are the two important pillars of economics, especially in macroeconomics that drives the economy altogether. So moving forward. Introduction in terms of what is money and the existence of money to the current world altogether. We initially started with a barter system, a very, very important concept that we have to learn. Even before money came into picture and people started counting the value of money, what was the system that existed in this world was the barter system. Why is barter system important and was considered to be important because barter system means only exchange of goods. Now we do not know the value of goods. If I am going to give you 100 bags of rice, you will give me back 100 bags of wheat. So the exchange between rice and wheat was a barter system. We are just going to exchange goods. We are not going to exchange value. Barter system was created in order to promote transaction. Transaction of goods without value. It was only understood that based on certain priorities, based on certain system in mind, barter system was created. Now this barter system existed in this world for many, many years. So it was not something that it came all of a sudden. That was the beginning for an economic transaction to happen in this world. But unfortunately, after some time period, we started understanding that barter system cannot exist for a longer time period, cannot be the only way of running the business. So what we wanted to do is that we wanted money, we needed some currency factor altogether. We needed a value, we needed a denomination through which we can trade, through which we can go and tell people the value of 1 kg of rice is 50 rupees, the value of 1 kg of wheat is 40 rupees. So we need to start thinking about the concept of value. So that is why each one of us wanted the concept of money to come into the world. So when the concept of coins started coming into this world, people felt excited because accumulation of wealth, accumulation of value started happening. Every coin that you hold in your hand has a value. Every rupee that is there in your bank has a value. So the concept of value, the concept of understanding that you are accumulating a financial value, a financial upgradation in your life led to the existence and emergence of money. So we started having currency in different forms and format. It might be metal coins like copper, silver, gold, all those kind of factors were considered to be currency and we started accepting them. As we started progressing and as we started coming towards the 19th century altogether, we started understanding the concept of rupees. We started seeing money in the form of paper, physical cash in the hands of people. So that is where currency got accepted as the most important format of transaction. Now every rupee that you hold has some denomination, 10 rupees, 20 rupees, 50, 
100, 500, 2000. So there is a value that is written on that note and that is the value what you are carrying in your hand. So that acceptance of a particular currency with its value makes economic transactions even more viable, even more feasible and important altogether. So moving forward. Functions of money. What is the basic function of money? Why is money so interesting when we talk about it in economics? Is it because it just holds the fraction or the value that you have money with you, you can buy everything or has it got some deeper meaning altogether? Let's have a look into it. The first function of money is a unit of account. Now, when you say that I have an account in a bank, let's say that I have an account in ICICI bank, HDFC bank or any other bank in this world. Now, what is the unit value of that account? That unit value of the account is measured in terms of money, which means there is some value in rupees, in coins, in paise, in some value it is denominated and it is value. So when I say I have $10,000 in a foreign bank, when I say I have 10 lakh rupees in an Indian bank, that is the unit value of the money, the unit value of the account. So it has been measured in terms of that factor. Second one, purchasing power. Very, very interesting, very, very important also. When you have money with you, you can purchase the world. That's what economics typically tries to tell people. Now, there are many factors which money cannot buy. Let's not try to be philosophical in this class, but let us try to understand only the importance of money. When you have money, you can physically buy out your needs and your wants, which means all the physical goods, all the materialistic benefits can be purchased using money. So money has the purchasing power. So when you look into the slide here, when you see the notes flying, when you see the currency being surrounded, around you automatically you feel excited you feel that yes now I have the power to buy whatever I want now I have the power to satisfy my needs to satisfy my wants altogether so that is where we talk about this factor called as purchasing power store of value for individuals very very important and an interesting concept why because whenever people go to an ATM and they put their debit card, they see a nice value on the screen. That is their bank balance. That's quite interesting, that's quite motivational and that's also exciting at some point of time. Whenever you put your card and you see a nice balance seen on your screen, it immediately gives you a feeling of joy, a satisfaction saying that yes, my value in terms of rupee is so much. So that gives me the store of value for individuals. So when you say that my bank balance is a six digit figure, it's an eight digit figure, it's a 10 digit figure, that's the store of value for you as an individual. So you can proudly say that the storage value, my measurement, my valuation is all about that money which I have stored in my bank account. Next, universal acceptability. When you travel across the globe, people do not want to know your nationality. People do not want to know your race, creed, class, but people want to know what do you carry with you. So what do I carry with me? I carry cash. I carry all the powers of money that is be able for me to travel across to buy whatever I want. I would become a global traveler. I would become globally accepted. Why? Because I have money. So somewhere down the lane, money is accepted. Dollar is accepted. Euro is accepted. Yen is accepted. Rupees is accepted. You name the currency, they are accepted. So money talks in this world. So that's where we bring in the concept of universal acceptability across any country in this world wherever you travel whatever you want to purchase whatever you want to establish you need money and money has to be accepted in across all the places so that's why universal acceptability is a very very important concept that we will be speaking in economics now moving forward the demand for money how does the demand for money get created? Is that when you start seeing the picture, you start imagining that the money factor here starts moving up. You know, you want to see that the growth in money happens all of a sudden. But is it possible? Economically, is it possible? The answer to that is quite simple. Why? Because if you start seeing here, the rise in income, that's the first and the foremost thing. 
In economics, we always try to understand the income as the most important factor for consumption in a consumer. In macroeconomics, we believe that whenever the consumer's income starts increasing, automatically the demand for money goes up. If I was earning 10,000 rupees, suddenly my income becomes 20,000 or 30 or 40. What is now happening in me is that the need for money becomes more. Whether will I spend all the money outside is a secondary question. But what is primary is that with the increase in income, the increase for the need of money also goes up. So that's where I'd say rise in income is the primary function, is the primary factor for demand for money. Quantum of transaction. When I have only 10,000 in my hand, probably I do not know what to do. Why? Because my transactions are quite limited in nature. I will not be able to spend as much as I want. But if my income suddenly becomes 1 lakh rupee, as you see the graph going up, suddenly my income starts going up like this in a trajectory manner, automatically my transactional value will also start going up. I will try to make more and more transactions. I will buy more, I will spend more, I will try to see that because I have money, now I want to make more purchases more transactions altogether so the quantum of transaction this word is very very important the value the number of transactions will start going up the next one interest rate what is this interest rate altogether now if you want to secure your money one of the most common factors that you need to understand is that you have to keep your money in bank so that's where you start getting a secured interest rate, which means secured financial growth altogether. So banks and financial institutions make it a point that they give their customers a secured financial growth. So for example, you go to State Bank of India and you deposit 1 lakh rupees at the rate of 6% interest. So now you know that at the end of one year, the rupee value, that is your deposit value, would have grown up to 1 lakh 6,000 rupees. So automatically what is happening is that interest rate is coming into factor which will in turn increase the demand for money. So higher the interest rate, people will try to put more deposits into the bank. They want to see their wealth growing up without putting much of effort. So that is why interest rate is a very, very fascinating topic in economics altogether. Higher the interest rate, what happens? People try to accumulate money more. Lower the interest rate, people try to diversify the money out of the bank. They want to put it in other sectors where the return can be higher. But in general, we need to understand this fact very clearly that more of the interest rate, it demands for the money at a higher scale altogether. So let us move forward. Supply for money. Who supplies money for us? Who gives us that money? Who gives us that excitement altogether in life? It is none other than the RBI itself, the Reserve Bank of India. So the Reserve Bank of India is considered to be the apex body and the only body authorized to print notes and coins in India. So RBI becomes a very, very, very important personality in economics. RBI is the guardian of monetary policy in India. Anything that is related to money, RBI is the final authority. Now, commercial banks, they are the secondary factor which are guided by the RBI. RBI controls all the commercial banks in India, both the private sector as well as the public sector. So, they will disperse money on behalf of RBI to the customers. After that, there are financial institutions what we call it as NBFC, non-banking financial companies. There are many finance companies, for example, like Bajaj Finance, ICICI Home Finance, HDFC Limited. These are all non-banking financial companies which will also help in the process of distributing money or dispersing money to the consumers. Now, why this is important? 
the supply for money is always a restricted area it is not something where anybody and everybody can create their own money then money will not have any value so it is very very important the creation and the supply of money has to be restricted with one person with one institution with one authorized personality so that is where rbi takes a very very important stand it says that very clearly that at any given point of time i shall not allow anybody to print money i shall not allow anybody to create their own money it is only the rbi and the banks which are are entitled to handle the cash under the appropriate signatory and then give money to the consumers altogether so it is very very important to keep rbi is also an important question for our economic exam the final exam so we need to understand about the concept of rbi and we also need to understand the importance of rbi in the economy in terms of money and banking now moving forward now we are going to talk about money creation by the banking system altogether how does a banking system create money so money is printed so automatically is money being dispersed is money automatically coming into your pocket definitely not so there is some process there are some ideologies through which this money gets created in terms of the banking now how is it assets is equal to reserves plus loan in any bank if you take there are two factors one is called as a reserve the other one is called as a loan now every loan that is being dispersed by the bank to the consumer is an asset now for a consumer in terms of accounting loan is always a liability but for a bank loan is an asset because that is how they are going to receive interest that is how they are going to get their receivables so loan becomes a primary asset for them higher the dispersal of loans higher is the asset value for them now what is this reserve factor every bank is being advised by the rbi to keep a portion of the deposit money as a part of reserve now why do you have to maintain a reserve because reserve is a part of contingency in case of emergency we have seen many cases in india starting from yes bank starting to punjab maharashtra cooperative bank we have seen many cases where there has been an emergency situation and they have not been able to give back the money to the consumers so in order to prevent that situation from not happening every bank must create a reserve that reserve will be used only in times of emergency it is not to be used on a daily transaction basis at the end of the day the asset is calculated using reserve plus loans put together the second factor what are the liabilities for a bank if you have assets you will also have liabilities so what are the liabilities are we talking about the liabilities are the deposits so when the bank starts accepting deposit bank has to understand it is not its money it is not its own money it is the money of the consumer tomorrow the consumer will come to the bank and it will they will say that please return back my money so at that time the bank should be ready to pay back the consumer with the interest all together so every single rupee that is borrowed from the customer is a liability for the bank so every deposit which they have collected has to be returned back with the proper interest towards it so that's why bank consider all deposits as liability higher the deposits higher the liability also so somewhere we need to have a mix and match on the assets versus liability now what is the net worth of a bank so what is the bank actually worth of sir because when you say assets that is loans again it has to come back to us then only we can be secured when you say liability it is deposit so what is the bank actually holding what is the bank actually worth of it is nothing but assets minus liability so if your asset is more than liability that means the bank's network is in the positive if your liability is more than the asset that means the net worth is under negative situation so when you are running a banking system when you are trying to under stand the bank you need to see how much is the assets are there under the bank's control rather than just looking into the liability if the asset is more then they are on positive 
positive side if their liabilities are more then they are on the negative side altogether so that is how you will be able to calculate the net worth of a bank altogether thank you very much let's move to the next slide here we will now try to see about the factors called as the fictional balance sheet altogether now when you talk about the fictional balance sheet this is something we just have to understand from a standpoint of how a balance sheet is created in a bank now the reserves of a bank is 100 rupees so automatically how much will be the total the total will also be 100 we have an x amount of money out of which 100 rupees is kept as a reserve so the reserve immediately totals to 100 now when you move to the left hand side you have a deposit worth of 100 rupees net worth is zero so automatically total is 100 now look into your right hand side your left hand side versus right hand side you will automatically feel that the totals are matching the reserve is equal to deposit here so which means we have a deposit worth of 100 rupees we also have a reserve worth of 100 rupees now automatically you will be able to see that there is a balance as we have mentioned in the previous slide all deposits are liability and all reserves are under asset so now asset and liability are matching which means the bank is in the neutral position assets is equal to liability so they are neither positive nor negative altogether so every single rupee that has been earned has to be classified under assets and under liability with that we come to the conclusion of today's session the first session of money and banking i hope and believe that the class was interesting educative and informative for you this is very very important chapter for us in terms of economics so please do pay attention and please do learn the concepts clearly in terms of money and banking in the next session, we shall try to understand the different factors that are involved in money and banking, especially from the transactional perspective altogether. Until then, goodbye and good luck from my side. Stay tuned, stay blessed and stay enlightened for always. Thank you once again for joining me in today's session.